Twenty years after the death of Eli, Samuel led the nation in repentance towards the Lord, and they entered another time of peace with Samuel as judge. Now it came to pass, when Samuel was old, that he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel. The name of his second was Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, with which they have forsaken me and served other gods. So they are doing to you also. Now therefore heed their voice, however you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behaviour of the king who will reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who asked him for a king. And he said, This will be the behaviour of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots and to be his horsemen. And some will run before his chariots. He will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties. will set some to plough his ground and reap his harvest and some to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks and bakers and he will take the best of your fields, your vineyards and your olive groves and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your vineyard and give it to his officers and servants. And he will take your male servants, your female servants, your finest young men, and your donkeys, and put them to his work. He will take a tenth of your sheep, and you will be his servants. And you will cry out in that day because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. Nevertheless, The people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, No, but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he repeated them in the hearing of the Lord. So the Lord said to Samuel, Heed their voice and make them a king. And Samuel said to the men of Israel, Every man go to his city. My name's Arthur and I thank you for joining me as we share together 1 Samuel chapter 8. The appointment of a king in Israel was foreshadowed in the writing of Moses. Moses gave instructions that when there was a king, he should not multiply gold and silver, that he should not multiply horses and that he should not multiply wives three things that Solomon will be famous for. But the institution he set up was that there should be judges. The first thing Moses had to do when he began to lead the children of Israel was to act as a judge for them, to make judgments among them. And so there needed to be a chief justice. But God was their king, God was their lord, And so the judge was simply delivering the judgments that, according to the law that God had given and that the people had adopted. The law of Moses was their constitution and they were operating within that. When they walked in the ways of God, then they had peace. It was only when they turned away from God that God said, okay, you don't want to walk my way, then you can go and walk the way of the gods who you want to follow and see how good that is for you. And so he withdrew his protection and let them experience 
what the gods of the world had to offer. They invariably turned back to him and prayed, in which case he delivered them and gave them another judge who would judge them according to the word of God. But they are not happy. They see the other nations around them operating on a different model and they want to have a kingdom. They want to have a man at the top who will do everything for them. And Samuel explains to them, he's not going to do everything for you. He's just going to take you and make you do everything for him. He will charge taxes. He will take your people to serve him. He will take your property and land. And when you complain about his behaviour, I'm not going to intervene and change the model again. But they are determined. They want a king. It's not that they are unhappy with Samuel, but they realise that Samuel's sons were not walking in the righteousness that Samuel walked in. They were judges, but they were judges who were taking bribes. They were showing favouritism to one versus the other. Now, of course, there's nothing to stop a king being exactly like that. When you have a king who is a judge, things will go well if you have a good king, and things will go poorly if you do not have a good king. It all rests on the person who is in the position not on the title that you have given them. So it is in administrations. Dictatorship can work fine if you have a godly man who is ruling the nation. And a democracy works terribly when you do not have godly men leading the nation. Rulers who are bent on their own comfort and elevation and honour are always bad, no matter what the political structure is. Samuel warns them of the behaviour of the king. The king will take away their freedom as citizens of the country and make them servants of the king. Not all of them, but many of them. They say, no, we still want to have a king. We want to be like the other nations. We want a king that may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And the Lord gives way often to our desires so that we may learn that our way is not the best way or the good way. But if we won't be told, if we won't learn by instruction, then we must learn by experience. You can learn the easy way or the hard way. And God lets us learn the hard way when we refuse to learn the easy way. So he says, Give them a king. Give them the kind of king that they want to rule over them. Now, in due course, God will establish his own king. But the character of his king will be different from the character of the kings of the world. For the kings of the world take their authority under the princes and powers of the earth, we're told in the New Testament. Satan claims to be the prince of all the earth and the one who oversees the the kings of the earth and so he tries to bring all nations together in mighty kingdoms and he can do that when you have a, a political structure where all the authority rests with one man or, or woman and so you just have to win over that man or woman you can do it by overtures of promises or you can do it militarily and so Throughout history, mighty men have gone to war fighting others that they might have glory for themselves and that Satan's plan for the kingdoms of the world might be fulfilled. But God has raised up a king, the Lord Jesus, who is of a completely different character, who didn't raise up an army to take over the kingdoms of the world and who has allowed the world to go its own way, although he has called individuals within the world to walk his way. And so God's people have always suffered persecution in a world that does not want to go God's way. But how can we learn? God has allowed the political structures that we have that we might learn not to put our hope in princes or in men. It is God only we can trust.